Good evening, good afternoon. My name is Tatiana Kovac. This is podcast Happy at Work. In our podcast today, we will discuss one of my loveliest topic, people-centered culture. And today, my guest is a person who has really inspired me for a long time uh, because she's shared a lot of very, very interesting and very useful information in her LinkedIn. This is Manjari Singya. Hi, Manjari. Hey, Tatiana. Thank you for having me here. Uh, before we start our conversation, because I know you, but not uh, all people in my audience know you. So I want to ask you to introduce yourself, but not maybe only about the current position, but uh, also about your professional background. I think it's really interesting because our background help us to become a person which we are. Excellent. Thank you. First of all, uh, let me say that I'm superbly honored to uh, be invited to your podcast. I've heard a lot of great things about you and your podcast. Um, I'm Manjuri Sinha, born and brought up in uh, New Delhi, worked in different cities in New Delhi, uh, in India, um, all across Mumbai and Hyderabad and uh, Pune was my last stint. Have I call myself a uh, master of uh, global talent dynamics uh, because I've worked in different continents as such in, uh, in different organizations. I've almost worked in all facets of HR, have 20 plus years of experience across companies like um, Tata in India, Hewlett Picard, Accenture, Zalando in Berlin, and OLX for the past uh, four, uh, four years and about eight months now. Um, and it's it's been an, a tremendous journey, Tatiana. I really love this. Uh, I, I usually say I love my job. Um, even when I have my rant moments of, you know, HR rant moments, I still say that I love my job. I, I can make an impact on so many people. And that's what I really, really uh, love about my job. Um, and yes, as I said, I've lived in India, I've lived and worked across uh, India, Czech Republic, Sweden, and called Berlin home for the past uh, 10 years now. And uh, apart from my uh, HR career, I also have another persona or a hat. And that's something uh, I love uh, to share. I love to learn. And that's taken me to different conferences as a speaker, as a keynote speaker, as a panel speaker, uh, up to uh, New York for LinkedIn Talent Connect last year, where I spoke there in Unleashed and certain other uh, forums. And of course, prestigious podcasts like yours. Um, I've, I also have co-authored a book called Builder's Guide to the Tech Galaxy. It's a support for tech founders to look at the people topic, which a lot of the tech founders do ignore in the beginning. And actually, that's what causes problems in the end. And very recently have been published in one of the case studies by the Josh Person Academy as well. So that's me. And on my personal side, uh, it's me and my partner. Uh, we live in Berlin together. We love to travel uh, across Europe and beyond Europe. And uh, and our passions lie in uh, checking out different cuisines and different kinds of wine. So that's uh, that's me, Tatiana. Oh, that's great. Hope to see you one time uh, in Brazil and checking the Brazilian uh, cousin <laughs> with your uh, friends. Uh, it's really got a very uh, uh, interesting and impressive career path. Uh, I think uh, what uh, you uh, write uh, and speak a lot, and I see what you speak a lot about people-centric approach, mm -hmm. a people-centric culture. Uh, my first question, what is uh, does it mean for you, people-centric culture, people-centric approach as for HR? Absolutely. Um, and and Tatiana, I can, I can give a little bit of a context as well. So my experience of human-centric and people-centric has also grown through different organizations, also grown, grown through different cultures, because there's always a culture context to organizations and the countries that they function in. Um, how I see it is when, when you have recognition uh, from the organization and the organization leadership as such, that business performance and organization success is primarily driven by engaged, motivated, and fulfilled employees and fulfilled workforce. That is a human-centric culture. Uh, it's pretty close to what we talk about when we say human-centric 
product design or human centric process design in in our tech world right so when we talk about let's look at the user problem let's start from where our customers can see meaning what problems are we solving for the customer taking the same approach when we look at uh, organizations and look at within the organization looking at our talent practices or hr i really don't like to call them policies but yes hr policies and and programs itself and somehow putting the human in the midst of everything even in your hardest decisions putting the human in the midst of everything that's something that stands out for me as a human centric or a people centric culture or organization uh agree with your uh usually we uh, have a huge discussion about a uh, people centric approach but because from one hand we should uh, or be oriented on the uh, company's goal Mm -hmm. uh, from this perspective, we uh, could be interested with people work hard. From another perspective, we should care about employees, uh, especially if we understand what the people uh, work better in a situation or why they care, uh, they get care. Uh, from your perspective, how to find the right balance between uh, productivity, uh, high performance, hard work, and uh, between the people, a person, uh, personal needs, um, and so on. Absolutely, that's it. And I think, you know, you, you, your, the, your question pretty much uh, is a discussion between the CFO and the CHRO, right? So, that, and, <laughs> and I can imagine the CEO sitting in the room and, okay, observing which one kind of wins. But it's, it's, it's interesting. And there's a, there's a, for your listeners as well, I would like to recommend a book called Making Work Human by Eric Mosley and a podcast between Brené Brown and Eric Mosley, who's uh, the author of this book. Um, and interestingly, this podcast was recorded in 2020. This talks about, this is where Eric, and this was amidst uh, the most volatile period, COVID had just started, pandemic impact, companies that you know, started working from home, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we were dealing with a very new world at that point of time. And there are so certain things that uh, Eric kind of borderlines or calls out in this book, which stand out for me. And exactly when we talk about this whole challenge of, uh, are we looking at the business goal? Are we looking at our profit and loss? Are we looking at the profit margin? Of course, we are today living in a world, um, and especially after the pandemic, we've seen number of layoffs, number of companies right-sizing themselves. Uh, tech has been impacted, right? So all that is is there. And of course, we are in the business of making money. All of us are, unless it's an NGO, we are in the business of making money. However, it's it's all about the long-term and the short-term. If you look at a long-term approach and, and drive this making money or driving your profit margins via your workforce, which in a sense is what we do, and actually focus on that long-term approach, that's where the tenets of uh, human-centric workplace come into play. And this is where Eric kind of talks about three things. He talks about giving purpose, and interestingly, he also talks about meaning, which is a little bit separate to purpose, and then real gratitude for the employees or amongst the employees, creating that kind of culture. And when we talk about such topics as emotion, recognition, gratitude, Tatiana, many a times, this is where people feel that we're talking about fluffy subjects. Actually not. It is, it is a proven fact by surveys like Gallup, by Gartner Research as well, that it's your motivated employees, engaged employees, those are the ones who drive business success. A company which has higher number of engaged employees, which has a culture of celebration and gratitude is more successful uh, as, as a business as well. So it's it's not something that we're talking about today. It's something that decades of research has, uh, have shown. Even during, I think another interesting topic about this particular podcast and Eric is, when organizations went into the pandemic period and started working remote, it was very interesting that companies that invested in creating a positive human culture before the pandemic actually could reap benefits during the pandemic because you had this whole aspect of working remote, so you couldn't have shared experiences. When we are working remote completely, you get onto a Zoom, you probably have a minute small talk, uh, especially if it's a bigger meeting, you don't even have that small talk. You just get your business done and it, it ends. But prior to that Zoom life, when we were in offices completely, we could literally share our experiences. 
some of our colleagues would talk about him getting married and you share the experience, right? You're invited to that wedding. Uh, somebody is having a, having, having a baby. Somebody is celebrating a birthday. Somebody is also going through a, some kind of a, a grieving period. But those shared experiences are lost with this hybrid remote environment. So companies who had this prior to pandemic actually reap benefits there. So it is, it is not either or as I see it. I think it is very, very required for a company that wants to reach that profit margin to focus on engagement, to focus on motivation, to focus on well-being for their employees. I feel that in the situation that the company uh, decided to go uh, for long run uh, with their employees, uh, it, uh, it's invested in the people who are working in the company. Uh, and my next question for you is uh, about uh, burnout. Mm -hmm. It's not very popular from one side. From our side, now is uh, one of the most popular topics. Yeah. Uh, because after pandemic, after a lot of uh, uh, difficult situation, uh, economic, political in the world, there are a lot of people now find themselves uh, in the situation of burnout. From your perspective, how company could help employees to prevent burnout? Because when we discuss this topic, it's very interesting. On one side, people said, this is personal. The person yeah. should work with uh, his or her burnout. From another side, absolutely uh, all professionals said, this is the problem of, of system. We have to work with it on a systematic level. From mm -hmm. your perspective, about burnout, how could comp a company prevent burnout of your employees? Very, very, very important topic, uh, Tatiana. Last year, uh, Glassdoor uh, presented a report, an aggregated report that talked about the word anxiety um, being used 138% more than any of the years that they've seen this word being used. So that's that's a data point exemplifying the situation of, of the workforce. There was another research uh, Gartner presented that talked about the mistrust between employees and employers with very different things like you know flexibility, layoffs, et cetera. And that caused burnout, uh, burnout as well for, uh, for employees and, and managers. There's a shortage of skills. Uh, a lot of organizations went into doing more with less in the last years. That has caused burnout with employees plus managers. Um, given the uh, number of uh, layoffs in, in the tech industry, there is a lack of security of job. That's, again, something that leads to uh, burnout for, for uh, people. I think it's uh, super important practically to look at, first of all, acknowledge that this is happening, number one. You cannot push this under the carpet, cannot blame it on external factors only. Yes, we are living in an exponential fast-paced world. But we, as organizations, need to take responsibility, acknowledge this first. I think the leadership has to, first of all, acknowledge this, number one. Number two, uh, somehow look at possibilities of disassociating disasso the manager responsibilities a little bit because managers also are burnt out. So providing support uh, as coaches, and uh, this is a practical example that I can take from our organization, where we looked at a program called Better Up. Better Up is a platform. And um, and maybe you've heard recently, they've also tied up with Brené Brown for their platform and, and getting guidance for them. They have, uh, they've come up with a product called Better Up Care. And there are similar products in the market. So uh, of course, companies can use whatever they want. And these are experienced coaches, really certified experienced coaches, uh, available from all around the world. You can have your employees assigned to this platform and really also seek out um, support and coaching in very different facets of life, not just work. And this is what uh, we, we talk about when we talk about getting that meaning at work and outside. There are times when these employees are, and we don't get per employee data, of course, but when we look at some anecdotes, we have anecdotes from our employees after the pilot that we uh, run with them. Um, uh, that we ran with them, they said that uh, they've been able to deal with personal grievances or personal losses. They've been able to deal with the career development conversations. They've been able to deal with, hey, I've just stepped up into my new role. How do I you know, plan my first 90 days? So very different facets, but they've been able to deal with this. Managers 
whatever said and done, yes, we can, you know, focus on training them, etc. But there'll always be one, uh, you know, hidden motive of, okay, let's have productivity, efficiency, etc. But when you disassociate this and have a coach who's neutral, and the whole interest of that coach is actually in ensuring that this person moves forward, is getting support, is neutral as well. I think those are things that that matter. So providing such kind of coaching support in any manner or form is one of the best ways of dealing with uh, burnout. Of course, then uh, there are some structural aspects as well. Looking at your ratios of teams, looking at your uh, managerial ratios. Is it a lot for the managers? What are we dealing with, et cetera? Uh, prioritization, like I mentioned, do more with less. I think that's an, another topic of looking at prioritization. So this is one way of dealing with we, dealing with burnout and really uh, catching uh, catching the problem by the neck, providing coaching support in the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to discuss you one topic which is important for me. This is a topic of respect and trust in work. Yeah. You mentioned it earlier, but it's very important uh, what the people feel themselves respected, uh, feel gratitude from the company uh, and the trust of the company. What is the best way uh, to build it in, uh, in the company, to trust, to gratitude? Uh, Absolutely. I think it, everybody wants to be seen uh, that, yeah, I mean, there are there are extremes like me. I mean, my husband says I'm a narcissist. So I really want to be seen. <laughs> All right, jokes apart. Um, everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to have that moment when you can be recognized for what you do, for your contribution, for your work, uh, for your inputs. And th when there was there was a research again, I'll go back to Eric Eric Morsele again and his book. There's a research that he had conducted, and majority of people when they were asked, "What do you appreciate? What do you want your organizations to do better?" And they came back with this one thing called as culture of appreciation. Does that mean that I'm going to get a gold star every time I do something? No. It actually means creating a culture where my peers can, without a reason, come up and say, hey, Manjuri, thank you for doing this. Hey, thank you for doing this. And I think that goes a long way. You need to create that culture. How can you do that practically? A lot of organizations have these uh, founding principles, Tatiana, or leadership behaviors, et cetera. Many a times, and this is a very draconian way of doing things, many a times organizations only have the set of probably their management team or a select few people who get into the room, 15, 20 people, and then they decide, okay, these are the behaviors. These are the values that we will live by. There's a change. We are living in a human decade today. We are living in a decade where AI is going to come and uh, you know, automate a lot of spaces. So how do we match this? The best part of creating this culture of appreciation and ensuring that everybody in the organization feels seen, starting point could be when you go about setting your employee value proposition or your values or leadership behaviors, involve your employees. In a, in a sense, delegate management of engagement to the entire organization, not just to yourself. Delegate management of purpose to the entire organization. In that way, you can, in a, in a sense, get everybody rallying behind that purpose as well. And they feel that there's a, there's a part of shared essence. You can do it through focus groups when you're setting up your values. You can do it through a survey. You can do it through having representatives from most of your organizations, maybe 70, 80 people, really hacking their brains out and then saying, okay, these are the values that we believe in and these are the values that we'll work through. You'll get that participation. That's where people will find that sense of appreciation that yes, we are treated as intelligent human beings and our uh, inputs have value. That's that's one. The second, Tatiana, is about listening. Um, most, uh, most of the times we lean on these once a year surveys, twice a year surveys, we live in a fast-paced world. You just you were just talking about that in your question uh, previously. Our world today is changing almost every three weeks or four weeks. Be it politics that affects everybody today, be it uh, you know technology that again affects everybody today. With this kind of a fast-paced world, we have to be really close to our workforce and different organizations. All of us are working in distributed setups today. We work in hybrid setups today. We, you could be an organization of 2,500 people or 300,000 people. If you 
go towards a strategy of continuous listening. You can really go for something that Josh Person calls as employee activation, listening from your employees on a regular basis. If you do a change or release a new policy or release a new communication, ensure you put in two extra questions in a pulse survey that you can have a very short, sporadic reach out and ask your employees, okay, what do you think about this? What, how did it impact your work? Did it change? Did it make it positive? Uh, do you have any suggestions for this? And you can get the pulse back and take a decision accordingly. So these are these are different aspects that we can start changing towards with the world of work changing around us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure what if a company, if leader uh, listening uh, employees, it's very, very good for uh, building trust. Uh, my next question is about cross-cultural issues. Yeah, because when they discuss, uh, you have really huge experience uh, working in different uh, cultures uh, in different countries. Uh, and if they discuss a cross-cultural topic, uh, and then they discuss uh, building trust, uh, listening, uh, communication, we have uh, to take it into account, especially if uh, we discuss working with global corporations. Uh, what is your approach uh, for building, for creating uh, the space for trust, for communication in cross-cultural uh, 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 in the cross-cultural situation in the company? Absolutely, that's a that's a very good point, and I'm a big fan of Erin Meyer's culture map. Uh, that's a a book that everybody should have on their you know a bookshelf and read it for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, and it 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 plays a big role. So, like you said, you know, I've worked with companies where uh, a big portion of the team was in India and Asia, and then some parts were in Europe and vice versa as well. Um, it starts from awareness, Tatiana. I think creating that awareness that yes, there is a distance um, that you have in high context and low context cultures, and this could be tackled with um, certain sessions, programs could be. Also assigned learning paths like we do in our organization. We have certain inclusive learn inclusion and inclusive learning paths assigned to everyone who starts. Um, so that's one. Second, from the also from the perspective of leaders to ensure that you understand your teams uh, and have an open dialogue. And open dialogue doesn't necessarily mean where you only give space to people who are loud or uh, extroverts, but also introverts. Very simple things. And I've learned this from... Um, feedback from my team, actually, and I, I can I can be vulnerable here saying that. Um, so I'm I, I'm technically an extrovert, right? So since I was a small kid, my mom actually calls me a parrot because I love to talk a lot. Um, and then, <laughs> so I do that, and and in a sense, a lot of my team will, would also do that. And I got a feedback once, and I, I said, hey, I don't sometimes hear a couple of people in the room, and I don't get your input. And one of one of my one-on-one -on -one sessions, I shared this with uh, one directs, and this person said that, yeah, I'm not very comfortable speaking up when seven other people have spoken or a bit louder than me. Uh, maybe you could ask us to, in an in-room meeting, put our thoughts on a post-it and put it up on the board. We could read them out and then have a discussion. It, it'll be more comfortable for me. And this was interesting. This was super interesting. And I had a very diverse team at, at that moment from very different cultures. We had folks from Italy and Spain, and of course, very out there, out in the open. And we had a lot of folks from Eastern Europe who were not that loud, et cetera. Um, so it was very interesting. So I changed that mode in my next meeting, and I immediately saw impact. And I started sharing that with my, with my peers as well, that, hey, I think we oversee uh, these aspects. Um, and this is just a switch. And that's where, just with this example, I want to say when you make the leaders aware that there are differences in different uh, cultures, you need to ensure. What is very important and also learned this, Tatiana, out of uh, probably a bit of a bad experience is not putting the first person who comes into a homogeneous group in, 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 a, in, a, in a setup where they are set up to fail. So for example, if you have, say, uh, a all an all-German team, right? Uh, in that, if you have the first person from India coming in and joining, it's always good to also make them aware. So have an awareness session, have a prototyping session all together, make them have that dialogue together as well. Um, and for this, practically in our company, we've introduced something called as meetings in a box. Uh, it's not just about cultural context, it's about uh, various other aspects of diversity, but you can, of course, 
have culture as a con uh, context and concept there. It's encouraging uh, and giving a tool to managers, again, because when you talk about these um, intersectionalities of culture, of race, of gender, uh, identification, et cetera, PWD, it's difficult to have such dialogues in a 10,000 people setup. It is easier for the manager themselves to have this conversation with their team of six or seven people. And this is where we provided that toolkit to have uh, open conversations. Managers go through a training and then they can actually have an open conversation with their teams to set up how should we communicate? What should be our meeting cadence? If there's a challenge and somebody feels uncomfortable, how do you come up to me and so on and so forth? So I think these are different tips and tricks to handle that uh, uh, context of different cultures and bringing them close and bring them together. And allyship matters a lot because there are times that you may not have um, folks who are aware of some things, right? So, for example, um, it was it was very nice when I started working in Germany for the first time. It was 2015, and it was uh, one of the most important festivals for India. And I came back from a meeting and found a post-it on my uh, laptop saying "Happy Diwali." And that one thing just made me, you know, so happy that okay, somebody thought about that. Similarly, I had a colleague from uh, Pakistan who was working with us. So during Ramadan, I would ensure that everybody knows that, hey, let's, I know we do that as a team, that we ask everybody, let's go for lunch. During these days, we shouldn't ask him, let's go for lunch. So just, just uh, kind, of, kind of a thing, but this is my learning from India, being in India with different cultures as well. So I think that's being an ally that you can make everybody uh, aware uh, that these are small nuances that you can also do on a cultural basis. Mm -hmm. uh, I really love uh, your ideas about, from, from one side, the systematic approach, about toolkit, from another side, about uh, small steps, like remember, respect, yeah. uh, a celebration, or respect uh, of some tradition, like Ramadan. It's very, very uh, important of a building uh, human-centric culture. Uh, my next question for you, this is about two kids. It is about mm -hmm. leaders and the situation of hybrid or hybrid or remote work. I remember uh, how we discussed uh, this topic of free data caster uh, and uh, how it's difficult to work with people all over the world, especially if they don't have possibilities uh, to uh, meet each other personally. Because a lot of information we could get uh, from the personal contact, uh, from the body language, uh, uh, from a, a lot of things you mentioned earlier. Uh, in a situation when the most time we work remotely with some colleagues, uh, or we work in a hybrid situation, so for example, you see your colleagues once or twice a month, what is the best way in this situation uh, manage, manage trust, manage respect, uh, the, uh, manage uh, the human-centric approach? Yeah, very, that's a very good question. And I think nobody has found the holy grail of this one, Tatiana. I, I'm happy to share what I've seen working and uh, experimented uh, with some things as well. But everybody is looking for an answer to this. Uh, there are a lot of, of course, leaders also saying, okay, we need to absolutely come back to our old ways of working and you know create the same kind of shared experiences um yes and no i would say we've seen some advantages of working working through flexibility here so the best way like always would be to go a 50 50 to have that flexibility but somehow create um shared experiences i'm not for a setup where you can 100 percent work remotely completely not see your team at all i mean i miss that I tell my team, I said, okay, I might creep you up, but I like to touch people. I like to hug people. So, you know, it's it's so weird that I'm not getting to hug uh, my team members, etc. So I said, okay, at the cost of creeping you up, if you don't like it, tell me, I won't do that. But this is something that just creates a bond. How can you not, not do that uh, to your team for 10 months and 11 months and not see them, not share a meal together, etc. That's That's very weird. So I think we have to create those opportunities, even if there are uh, some teams that are working from different locations altogether, e either once in a quarter get together and focus some time, not just on deciding your goals and next steps and um, 
what is to be done on a you know product roadmap, etc. But actually invest one day or at least one and a half days in focusing on those shared experiences. It could be through team building. It could be through uh, leadership trainings. It could be also through peer learning workshops, etc. But bring them, uh, bring them together. Bring even uh, beginning of the call, and this is something that my uh, previous leader actually inculcated in us, is the sense of gratitude. Even on a Zoom call, you can start a call with talking about what you are grateful for uh, in the last week or uh, in the last two weeks or something. It could be personal. It could be at work. What, how, how are you feeling? And talk about those feelings. So you could be really going through maybe, um, you know, a, a, maybe a, a crisis at home and you're dealing with something and you can share that feeling with your team that, you know, even, a, even my Wi-Fi not working properly is a crisis for me, right? So I can share that with me, uh, with my team or a, a real challenge that is going on at home. So I think creating those human exchanges, that's another way of looking at uh, still creating uh, human experiences at work, finding out the the right balance, also figuring out, giving the option sometimes. So when a lot of companies uh, do resort to mandating, okay, these are the days that you come to office, these are the days that you work from home, etc. I think it's all about the choice. Like we got back to this whole aspect of culture of appreciation, treat everyone with respect. So if you want, maybe say a sixty percent work from office let the team figure out what works best for them. So I think these are things that people, uh, companies can do. The other thing is even in the worst times, uh, Tatiana, um, leaders do have an option of taking human centric approach. And we've seen these as probably negative examples during the last uh, year or so with certain leaders coming on a Zoom call and saying, I'm going to lay off 20% of our workforce and that's it. And you don't have any information, communication, et cetera. Even when you have hard decisions to take, and all companies have to do that, you can do that in the most human way possible. Are you designing that process in, with the human in mind? Are you thinking about providing most amount of support, whether it is financial support, whether it is even providing access to a coaching platform, providing access to learning platforms, et cetera? Can you do that in the most human manner? Can you have and ensure that every person is spoken to with proper time, given the information, okay, you have questions, come back, let us know what challenges, we will cater to each person uh, and treat them as human beings as well. In, in many companies have gone, gone through the same processes, but different companies have done it in a different way. The how is what really mattered. So another way of looking at human experiences and creating a human culture is in the worst time possible as well, can you put that uh, as a cornerstone? Mm -hmm. Uh, Andrea, uh, we covered uh, so many, uh, many topics during our conversation. It's really insightful for me, a lot of thoughts in my head, and uh, the time is flying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I remember about time, and uh, because for me, it's a so sign of respect of a person, remember about time. So I have my last question for you. This is the usual question. Uh, three, uh, main advice, uh, three main, main tips uh, to the audience, uh, to the people who want to be the, uh, who want to build a people-centric culture? Very simple, Tatiana, and to respect time, I will also keep it super short. I would say, remember these three things, thank, talk, and celebrate. These are the tenets of creating and nurturing a human-centric culture. Thank you, Manjure. Thank you for this conversation. I hope in the future to have a lot of possibilities to communicate with you. And I know what all the audience as me have a lot of possibilities to read uh, and hear your thoughts uh, from your LinkedIn because you're absolutely a person who shared a lot. Uh, and uh, for me, this is great work. It's a second work for you to share your ideas <laughs> at, uh, with uh, people around the world. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Thank you for inviting me. Really, really happy to have had this conversation. <laughs>